Thank you very much, uh, Ronnie. And uh, it's nice to see such a full house today. I'm going to speak uh, on kidnapped, um, both as a writer and as a reader. Um, really as a reader, though, and I, I, and I hope that I can offer some interesting angles on the novel which will help you to enthuse your students about it. Um, if I fail to do that, um, I will recommend right at the outset uh, the excellent Scott note by Chris McLaughlin, uh, which covers not only Kidnapped, but also Katrina, the sequel, and Treasure Island. Um, uh, and uh, some of what I will say in the next half hour, you will find also explored by Chris in that same study guide. Um, uh, I, I'm assuming that that's available outside, yes, so that's also available outside today um, from the ASLS table. Um, I, I was looking around um, online as well for other interesting or useful resources and uh, there is one that I think is, is, is worth having a look at. Um, I'm sure there's more than one, but this particular one is an online a resource developed by um, an Edinburgh-based teacher, Matthew Wilson. Matthew's not here today by any chance, is he? No. Um, uh, in which all the Scottish set texts at higher and national five level are discussed in detail. And you can find that resource at www.myetutor.tv uh, forward slash. So uh, myetutor is M-Y-E-T-U-T-O-R dot tv forward slash and all you need to do there is go and click on free guides and there are resources for all of the uh, the, the text which i think and some of them are, are very good so it's another way that a place for you to go speaking for myself as a, as a writer i admire robert louis stevenson very very much i reread him more than i reread any other author it seems to me that he combines a lightness of touch with a, a real zest for life, but also an eye for the big, profound issues of human experience. I never get tired of Stevenson, and I wish, I really wish that I could write like him. Uh, and, I, and I meet contemporary writers, not just from Scotland, but from all over the place, who say exactly the same thing. Stevenson still has that ability uh, to excite other writers, contemporary writers, and to make us envious. So that's the first thing about him. The second thing I want to say is that when I reread Kidnapped uh, a couple of weeks ago in preparation for uh, this morning, I think it was my, I was trying to work out, I think it was the fourth time I'd read the novel from cover to cover. Um, I was struck by how fresh and invigorating a read it is. Uh, it really is a very, very good read, it struck me. And although I have to be careful and not assume that my now middle-aged perspective um, much resembles the perspective of a 21st century teenager, I also think it's quite an easy read. I don't think its language or its style pose insurmountable problems for a 17-year-old or a 15-year-old with, with an average or a good reading ability. Um, I, I was trying to think back when I first read Kidnapped, and I think I was probably 16, so round about the age um, of, of your students. It is, I think, highly readable. Stevenson is a modern writer, it seems to me. He bridges the gap between uh, the 19th century and the 20th century. And if you think about it, because he died so young, um, he seems to be slightly trapped in the 19th century. But if he had lived um, to be even moderately old, even if he had lived to be, say, 70, he would have uh, outlived World War I, uh, which I think is an interesting concept. That would have absolutely and firmly placed one of, one of his feet into the uh, 20th century. Even as it is, his writing overlaps with the writing of S.R. Crockett, J.M. Barry, John Buchan, uh, to name three uh, uh, Scottish writers, and almost overlaps with the writing of Neil Munro. And both John Buchan and Neil Munro both, both clearly learned an immense amount from Stevenson. 
and this is evident in their own fiction, particularly their historical fiction. So what I want to do today is look at a number of different aspects of what Stevenson achieved in writing Kidnapped. And uh, I've divided this up into three broad headings. I want to talk about the realism of Kidnapped. I want to talk about the Scottishness of Kidnapped. And then I've got another category which I've loosely um, put under the heading Rites of Passage. So I'll deal with these three uh, aspects of the novel. Now, there are loads of other aspects of the book. One of the things about it is that uh, as, a, as a teacher, I think you can pick out all kinds of interesting themes and, and, and aspects of the novel. There's, there's, there is masses to talk about. Um, so, but I'm just going to concentrate on these three aspects of the book today. So, realism. Um, I, I suppose I've divided this, I've, I've, I've thought about this in two ways. On the one hand, it seems to me that Kidnapped is a very realistic novel. Um, and there is a sort of real life um, uh, horror about some of it as well, which is interesting thinking about um, some of Stevenson's other works. Um, but I, I think we also have to contrast that with something else that is going on in, in Kidnapped, Kidnapped, which is that there's a, a very romantic side to it as well, um, which is connected to ideas about fairy tales and dream. And I'll come back to that in just a second, but I want to start off uh, talking about realism. There are, there are examples on almost every page of this novel of the intense realism of the story. The very first sentence is time-specific. Um, he talks about, I set off on a certain day in the month of June in the year of grace, 1751. So he's absolutely placing this book at a real time in history. Within a page or two, Mr. Campbell the minister of Essendine, who is seeing Davy on his way as he heads off uh, on his adventures, is telling him that the house of Shaws, where his uncle lives, is at Cramond, near Edinburgh, and that it should take him two days' walk to get there. Um, so again, very specific in terms of location and the, the length of time the journey will take. Uh, and the minister goes on to say, if the worst comes to the worst, uh, and, uh, and he doesn't get a good reception when he gets to his uncle's house, he can walk two days back to Essendine and risp at the man's door. Uh, I'll return to geography and the importance of maps and kidnapped in a wee while, but there's no question that from the outset we're being drawn into a world and specifically a country that is very deliberately deline delineated. And even Davy... Uh, who is very excited by the prospect of, of setting out into this new world, this new life, specifies precisely who he is at a very early stage. He describes himself as a lad of 16 years of age, the son of a poor domine in the forest of Ettrick. Again, it's very specific. And the curious modern reader or curious young reader should already be asking questions based on the information that's coming through in these opening pages. What's a domine? What is a manse, perhaps, even? And what does to risp at the door mean? Where is Ettrick? And how do you get from there to Cramond? It seems to me it's hard to read Kidnapped without recourse to, at the very least, an outline map of Scotland. And, of course, uh, a map has been an integral part of the book in almost every edition that's ever been produced. I can point to other instances of intense realism in the book. There's a relentless but very accurate description uh, throughout of Scottish weather, for example, uh, in all its forums. Um, on the Isle of Erich, just off, uh, the, of, off Mull, where um, Davy is washed up after the shipwreck, the weather is a real torment and indeed it's a danger to his health. And there's no shying away from, from the impact of that on, on him as a as a, a young 16-year-old lad. And on that same wee aisle where he's washed up, Stevenson doesn't shy away from the violent sickness that David uh, experiences when he has to live off raw shellfish. Um, I'll just read you a wee bit from this. Um, I knew indeed that shellfish were counted good to eat, and I found a great plenty of limpets, which at first I could scarcely strike from their places 
not knowing quickness to be needful. Again, that, just think about that. Seems as it knows how to take limpets off rocks, and he's describing it there uh, in, in just a, a, a half a sentence. There were, besides some of the little shells that we call buckies, I think periwinkle is the English name. Beautiful little way of actually um, getting both Scots and English in, into that sentence, and I'll come back and talk about language later. Uh, of these two I made my whole diet, devouring them cold and raw as I found them, and so hungry was I that at first they seemed to me delicious. And then the next paragraph, perhaps they were out of season, or perhaps there was something wrong with the sea about my island, but at least I had no sooner eaten my first meal than I was seized with giddiness and retching, and lay for a long time no better than dead. A second trial of the same food, for indeed I had no other, did better with me and revived my strength. But as long as I was on the island, I never knew what to expect when I had eaten. Sometimes all was well, and sometimes I was thrown into a miserable sickness, nor could I ever distinguish what particular fish it was that hurt me. It's a really a clever and interesting description about uh, food poisoning. Um, and there's no question that Stevenson knows what he's talking about there, it seems to me. Uh, I'll, ju I'll just read the next paragraph as well, because it, it reminds, it's a good example of the description of the weather. All day it streamed rain. The island ran like a sop. There was no dry spot to be found. And when I lay down that night between two boulders that made a kind of roof, my feet were in a bog. Uh, again, uh, it's simple stuff, but it so absolutely places you in a real place. Um, um, the, when you get later on into the book, um, there's this, the agony that, uh, that uh, David describes in the flight across the heather that takes place over several chapters. The, the, the agony of actually having to get across the moor without being spotted by, by the soldiers uh, crawling on hands and knees. The physical pain, the hunger, the thirst, the soakings, repeated soakings, the, the heat at some points and the cold at other points. It's very, very realistically described. But contrast this with what I would see as the folk or fairy tale elements of the novel. Even the chapter headings have a rather traditional feel to them in this sense. Um, uh, let's, uh, I'll give you a wee sample of them. Um, I, the very first chapter is called uh, uh, um, I set off upon my journey to the House of Shaws. The next one, I come to my journey's end. Um, uh, the man with the belt of gold uh, appears later on. That's the first appearance of, of Alan Breck Stewart. The lad with the silver button. Um, uh, the house of fear, the flight in the heather. And then finally, uh, and towards the end of the novel, I go in quest of my inheritance. I come into my kingdom. Um, this is the story of a boy who sets out to seek his fortune. And in that respect, it's as familiar as a pantomime tale. It's as familiar as Jack and the Beanstalk or Dick Whittington. David, when he's stuck on the island, uh, the, the island of Erich, refers without, naming, without actually naming the book to Robinson Crusoe. And there are elements of his encounters that are very reminiscent, it seems to me, of the Pilgrim's Progress. At every step of the way, he meets folk who give him bed and board, or others who turn him away. There are fellow travellers who are shysters and beggars, and some of them are honest folk. There's an old wife who warns him against the House of Shaws and curses it. Um, again, all of these elements, it seems to me, are, are, are elements of folk or fairy tales. Uh, Alan carries a silver button, a token that Alan gives him that has almost magical power uh, in the Highlands, at least, in that once people have seen this button, they might, people who might otherwise have robbed him or shunned him actually say, oh, that's all right, and they actually help him out. Um, in, the, in the Highlands, at least, that silver button has more power than money. Um, then uh, I'm talking back, going back to, to the realistic side of things. There's a, there's a lovely scene near the end of the book when... Um, Alan and Davy reach lime kilns on the north side of the fourth, and they have to persuade the servant lass at the inn there to find them passage across the water. 
And it's very realistic the way that they actually cajole and trick her into, th into having sympathy for, for Alan. But of course, what then happens is that she rows them across the water. And again, it's a very, it seems to me that's a very sort of traditional folk motif that is being used there to get him back to claim his inheritance. And all this reminds us that Stevenson is not only, was not only steeped in contemporary uh, and classical literature, but he was also steeped in folklore, the kind of stories that his nursemaid uh, Cummy told him when he was a child. There are references, uh, for example, to the water kelpie legend. Um, there's uh, uh, another um, we aside towards the end of the book where he says, so the beggar in the ballad had come home. So he's thinking about uh, those kind of songs and ballads as well as reference points for his story. And of course also there are plenty of, of, of examples uh, in the novel of storytelling, oral storytelling, stories within the story. People are always talking to each other and telling each other stories. Um, and you could argue, I think, also that the whole of David's own narrative is a kind of form of oral storytelling. Because the question has to be asked, to whom is this story being told? As I said, he starts, he sets off at the beginning, the opening words are, I will begin the story of my adventures with a certain morning in the month of June. Who is he speaking this to or who is he writing it to? Um, uh, there's, a, there's a point, um, there are various points where he drops into the present tense. It becomes very almost colloquial. Oh, says Alan, such and such has happened. And he turns around and does this. So there are moments where we move into the present tense as a form of storytelling. Um, and I have to say, when I reread this, I meant to mark this in the, in the, in the, in my, on my notes, but I didn't and I couldn't find it subsequently. There's somewhere in the book, there's a bit where he says, for you must understand such and such and such. And he's talking to, almost as if he's talking to somebody who's listening to him rather than somebody uh, who's reading, uh, uh, reading a book. Um, uh, and the story begins with him saying, I will begin the story of my adventures. And it ends with, the hand of providence brought me in my drifting to the very doors of the British Linen Company, Company's bank. And between those two sentences, um, there is a quest, a journey, a, a legend um, uh, going on. Again, a kind of very traditional format of storytelling. But it's a legend that's been written, written down and written down very carefully. Um, the story, the subtitle is The Memoirs of the Adventures of David Balfour, written by himself and now set forth by Robert Louis Stevenson. So there's a sense there um, that this is something that has been handed down to, uh, to Stevenson as an author. The style is light throughout the novel and almost conversational, almost as if Stevenson has merely polished up a tale told to him by somebody else. But of course, David Balfour must be long dead by the time the book is published. So in a sense, you get a sense that the tale has been handed down um, uh, and has, in the course of being handed down, has become this very sophisticated late 19th century novel. So intense realism on the one hand, but these motifs of traditional uh, storytelling running through it on the other. Um, I think also it's worth making just a slight aside uh, con contrasting this novel with the models, the chief models upon which Stevenson uh, was in a position to build, um, models that he also wanted to break the mould of. And I'm thinking here specifically of uh, the novels, the Waverley novels of Sir Walter Scott, and in particular Waverley and Rob Roy and Red Gauntlet. Um, because thinking about novels set in the Highlands, these, are, these were the models in the 19th century upon which somebody like Stevenson could, could, uh, could, uh, could base his own writing. Um, Waverley is set in 1745 to 46, the, 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 uh, the Jacobite rising of that time. And Edward Waverley, uh, if those of you, for those of you who have read that novel, will know that he's a very impressionable young Englishman. Uh, uh, which makes a big difference um, because, of course, David Balfour is very much a young Scotsman. And he's also, Edward Waverley is also of a different class from David Balfour. Um, if you compare uh, Scott's other, what you might call Highland or Jacobite novels, 
Uh, Rob Roy is a first-person narrative like David Balfour that's set about 50 years earlier. But again, the narrator of that is a young Englishman. And Red Gauntlet, um, in its early chapters, is, is an, epistol an epistolary novel. Um, and the narrators are their uh, student friends, Darcy Latimer and Alan Fairford. And they're respectively a young Englishman and a young Scot. So um, Alan Fairford is maybe a wee bit more like Davy. Um, uh, or perhaps the two of them combined are like two sides of him. But I, I wonder actually what influence on Stevenson's story um, the friendship of those two um, had when he was thinking about the friendship between David Balfour and Alan Breck Stewart. Um, because Red Gauntlet is also about a, a novel about a young man kidnapped by an uncle or by the designs of an uncle. But Stevenson expressed his frustrations about, the sh about, uh, about, uh, about Walter Scott's shadow, the massive success that that shadow cast over writers like himself. Um, he wrote in a letter when he was only 24, Walter Scott, the ever delightful man, sane, courageous, admirable, the birth of romance in a dawn that was a sunset, snobbery, conservatism, the wrong thread in history, and notably in that of his own land. And I think that's really fascinating, and, and I'm going to move on to it in a second to talk about, about that. Because in Waverley, although Edward Waverley is out with Bonnie Prince Charlie and the Jacobites and effectively deserts the British army to be in the Jacobite side at Preston Pans, and although after that battle people can, can keep coming up to him and congratulating him on how well he's conducted himself, we never actually see Edward Waverley fighting, let alone killing anybody. And he's also constantly trying to shake himself out of a dream, a romantic dream about Flora McKeever, which turns into a nightmare. Um, that's completely different from the experience of, of David Balfour. David Balfour does kill people. He wounds people. He has to actually use uh, weapons uh, uh, to defend himself. Um, and uh, there's another interesting contrast where, um, again, it's, it's this business of realism as well. Um, there's a moment uh, just before the Battle of Preston Pans in Waverley when Edward Waverley, who's been away from home for a long time, hears across the battlefield, he hears the voices of English soldiers and it makes him go, oh my God, what have I done? I've, 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 I must wake up from this horrible dream I'm in. Um, there's, a con there's a similar moment um, uh, in Kidnapped uh, when he and Alan are stuck on the top of these rocks uh, near Glencoe, bustling, as the word is, uh, under the hot sun, and he hears English voices of the soldiers who are hunting for him. And it's a complete contrast, uh, and again, very realistic, I think, in the way he describes this. Um, um, it was in this way that I first heard the right English speech. One fellow, as he went by, actually clapping his hand upon the sunny face of the rock on which we lay and plucking it off again with an oath. Oh, I tell you, it's hot, says he. And I was amazed at the clipping tones and the odd sing-song in which he spoke, and no less at the strange trick of dropping out the letter H. To be sure, I had heard Ransom, that's the young laddie that uh, appears early in the book and, and lures him onto the ship, but he had taken his ways from all sorts of people and spoke so imperfectly at the best that I set down the most of it to childishness. My surprise was all the greater to hear that, ma that manner of speaking in the mouth of a grown man, and indeed I had never grown used with it, nor yet altogether with the English grammar, as perhaps a very critical eye might here and there spy out even in these memoirs. I'm going to come back to language in a minute. I have never grown used with it, nor yet altogether with the English grammar. How subtle and clever is that? Um, well, I'm going to come back to language in a wee minute, though, because it's a very important part of the, of the book. Um, um, yeah. I, I was talking about the, 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 the realism with which uh, uh, Alan, ha uh, sorry, Davy has to face up uh, to, to the situations he's in. Um, when, he, when he and Alan Breck Stewart are on the, the Brig Covenant and, and he sides with Alan against the captain and his crew, he actually shoots and kills men and he has to lay into them with a cutlass. Uh, but this is not straightforward or cartoon-like. Again, if I can read a very brief extract just keeping an eye on my time here. Um, um, the first thing that happens is that somebody comes through the, the skylight of the, of the roundhouse uh, and, the, and the glass is dashed in a thousand pieces and a man landed on the floor. Before he got his, got his feet, 
I had clapped a pistol to his back and might have shot him too, only at the touch of him and him alive, my whole flesh misgave me and I could no more pull the trigger than I could have flown. So he can't do it. But then the guy turns around and, has, and, 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 uh, and gets hold of him and roars out an oath and he's obviously going to have a go at Davy. And at that, either my courage came again or I grew so much afraid as came to the same thing. For I gave a shriek and shot him in the midst of the body. He gave the most horrible, ugly groan and fell to the floor. The foot of a second fellow whose legs were dangling through the skylight struck me at the same time upon the head and at that I snatched another pistol and shot this one through the thigh so that he slipped through and tumbled in a lump on his companion's body. There was no talk of missing any more than there was time to aim. I clapped the muzzle to the very place and fired. Again, it seems to me this is really, really realistic writing. It's exciting. It's very exciting. But there's no question that uh, that Davy is having to get involved in some pretty nasty stuff. And I think that's a very distinct and different contrast from what happens to Edward Waverley in, in the Scott novel. Um, when, when, he, when he comes to, after the fight is over, uh, the first thing that he does is, uh, um, he, 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 no sooner was it over than I was glad to stagger to a seat there was that tightness on my chest that I could barely breathe. The thought of the two men I had shot sat upon me like a nightmare and all upon a sudden, and before I had a guess of what was coming, I began to sob and cry like any child. This is a 16-year-old boy this stuff is happening to. I think this is a remarkably uh, uh, closely observed uh, uh, example of the kind of realism that, uh, that fills this novel. Um, Again, that comes back to haunt him um, much later on when he and Alan are on the run from Loch Rannoch down to Balwhither. Um, if I can, again, maybe just to give a wee, a wee hint of this. Um, he's, he's, he's in a terrible try time. There's the gloom of the weather. I'm never warm. My teeth chattered in my head. I was troubled with a sore throat, etc., etc., etc. And um, uh, when, when he slips into sort of semi-sleep, uh, he remembers things. He remembers the Tower of Shaws, the House of Shaws lit by lightning. He remembers Ransom, the young lad on the ship who is killed uh, by, by the, the, uh, the ship's mate, being carried below on the men's backs. He remembers Shuan dying on the roundhouse floor. That's one of the men involved in the fight there. He remembers Colin Campbell, that's the red fox, grasping at the bosom of his coat when he's shot. So these things come back to haunt David. Um, and again, I think that's a very... Uh, perceptive uh, way that Stevenson writes about the effects and impact of violence. So realism contrasted with traditional fairy tale elements of the story. The second aspect of the novel I want to talk about is Scottishness. And I've thought about this in three parts really. History, geography and language. It seems to me that you can't fully enjoy Kidnapped without a basic knowledge of Scottish history, and particularly, I suppose, the, the history of the 18th century. Um, and so I think if you, before you launch your students into the novel, or perhaps maybe after they've read the first couple of chapters, you do need to give them a bit of background. Um, basic stuff, you know, who were the Jacobites? What were the cultural and politi political differences between the Highlands and the Lowlands, um, and between different factions uh, in the Highlands and the Lowlands? Um, you know, what's, what's the significance of the Campbells and why does Alan Breck Stewart loathe the Campbells so much? Um, just as a wee aside, my grandmother, uh, who's long dead and who was the most mild-mannered of, of, of women as far as I can remember her, um, and it wasn't a, wasn't a MacDonald or anything else, but every time that she had the word Campbell, she would almost spit on the floor and say, dirty Campbells. Where she had got this from, I don't know. Perhaps she got it from kidnapped, but, uh, but I suspect it was something that came down to her uh, through other means. Um, I think it seems to be it's important that your students get some kind of sense of where some of this is coming from, and therefore a kind of broad overview of, of what is going on historically is quite important for an understanding of this book. Um, what happened to Gaelic and Tartan and weapons and the clan system after the Culloden and so on, because these actually formed the backdrop to the main historical event of the novel, the, the murder of Colin Campbell, uh, the, the Red Fox, uh, which of course Alan, uh, which of course Davy witnesses, and for which of course Alan Breck Stewart 
uh, uh, gets the blame. Um, now, the actual murder, in a way, is is uh, is, is uh, not so not so crucial. Um, it's, it's, that's a, a kind of plot device um, in this novel. In a weird kind of way, the, the, the details of that historical event become more important in the, se the sequel to Kidnapped in Kachina. Uh, but I would say that in Kidnapped, the, the murder is, is um, to use an Alfred Hitchcock expression, is a MacGuffin. Um, it's a trigger for action. Uh, but what really interests us, interests us in the novel is the action that follows, the impact that it has on David and Alan and almost everybody else. Uh, for example, there's that very interesting chapter, The House of Fear, when they arrive at, uh, at um, 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 the house of, of one of Alan's relatives in Appen, and they're all busy tearing up documents and getting weapons that they've hidden in the thatch and getting them out and trying to kind of absolve themselves for, from any, any uh, association with the murder of Colin Campbell, but they actually also know that, they, that, that they're going to be visited with trouble because of that event. And one of the joys of Kidnapped, uh, for me, is that it gives you a real sense of that older Scotland, of its politics, its tensions, and also the things that were changing forever. And I think this is absolutely deliberate on Robert Louis Stevenson's part. It's not for nothing that he inserts that vignette about the emigrant ship uh, leaving, uh, I think it's from, uh, from Loch Leven, um, which has nothing to do with the plot of the novel at all, really. But he wants to actually say, this is what is happening in the Highlands at this, period, at this period. And also, like where there's a brief mention of Glencoe as, as they pass through it. And again, it's very subtly done. Um, all, it, all it says is, uh, um, to, he describes wild mountains and the, the, uh, a foaming river. And I have sometimes thought since then that it may have been the valley called Glencoe, where the massacre was in the name of King William. That's all he says about it, but it's an important little mention. He wants to get in that these points of Scottish history are important to what is going on in the story that he's telling. Um, similarly, uh, later on in the book in Balhwida, and when, when Davy's been resting up because he's been so ill, um, there's a, pi a duel, a piping duel between Alan Breck Stewart and Robin, uh, Robin McGregor, uh, the, the son of Rob Roy McGregor. And that's important because it not only tells us something about the character of the two men, but it's a, 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 it's a lovely counterpoint in a way to Alan's rather foolish uh, and arrogant behaviour when he loses at cards to, to Clooney early on. But it also says something via David about the very sophisticated culture of Gaelic Scotland. And that, again, is no accident on Stevenson's part. He wants his readers to know that this is... Uh, uh, a place where there is a culture or has been a culture which has been either destroyed or is seriously under threat. So Kidnap takes you on a historical tour of Scotland, but it also of course takes you on a geographical tour from the borders to Edinburgh and Queensferry, then by boat right round the northern coast and again it's a nice touch, he says oh we had to go north of Orkney so that we didn't go through the Pentland Firth um, with its terrible currents, then down through the Minch to Mull uh, and then right through the west and central highlands into Perthshire, Stirlingshire, down the Allan Water, along the north side of the Forth, into Fife, and then back across to Queen's Ferry from Lyme Kilns and back to Cramond. Um, it's a very, very precise journey that we go on. And you need to explore that journey, I think, uh, with your students. Um, some of your students will know bits of the territories that are described. Many will know little or possibly even none of it. And I think it would be worthwhile to get out a big map, uh, a bigger map than the ones that are, that are usually available in the books, and actually trace that journey. And perhaps show them images of what Mull looks like, what Glencoe and Rannoch Moor and Ben Alder look like. Because to a large extent, some of these places haven't changed much in 250 years. It's a one, this book is a wonderful geography lesson, uh, quite apart from being a great history lesson. So that's two aspects of the very Scottish nature of this novel. And the third one, and I really don't have time to go into this in detail, is the way that Stevenson uses language to depict the country of the 18th century that he, where the adventure is taking place. There is a constant language exchange going on in this novel. There are at least four languages interacting. English, of course, Scots, 
Gallic, and then Latin comes in towards the end. And the skill and the even-handedness with which Stevenson handles the interaction of the first, of, first three of these, English, Scots, and Gallic, is quite remarkable. As, a, as an example, um, here's Alan telling Davy how he got away from the crew after the ship is wrecked off the Isle of Mull. Um, hang on a second. It's, uh, it's worth reading a wee bit of this out uh, just to give you a sense of it. Um, let's see. Yeah, he's, he's straight, he's cut, they, they've all got ashore and the crew are very, very angry with Alan um, and uh, they want to, uh, basically because they want to get even with him for, for the, the, the trouble he's caused them. And uh, he, uh, but then he gets uh, the support of, the, of, of Riach, uh, one of the men on the ship, uh, who actually decides that he doesn't want to see um, ill play done to him and says, I'll put my back to the Helanmans myself. Um, now, that's none such an entirely bad little man, Alan says uh, to Davy. Yon little man with the red head. He has some spunks of decency. Well, said I, he was kind to me in his way. And so he was to Alan, said he. And by my truth, I found he was his way a very good one. But you see, David, the loss of the ship and the cries of these poor lads sat very ill upon the man. And I'm thinking that would be the cause of it. Listen to the, the little Gallic rhythms that are in there, but it's not overdone. It's just beautifully, uh, just, just beautifully nuanced. Um, um, well, I would think so, says I. But how did Captain Hoseason take it? It sticks in my mind that he would take it very ill, says Alan. But the little man cried to me to run, and indeed I thought it was a good observe, and ran. The last that I saw, they were all in a knot upon the beach, like folk that were not agreeing very well together. <laughs> What do you mean by that, said I? Well, the fists were going, said Alan, and I saw one man go down like a pair of breeks. <laughs> but I thought it would be better no to wait. You see, there's a strip of Campbell's in that end of Mull, which is no good company for a gentleman like me. If it hadn't been for that, I would have waited and looked for you myself, let alone giving a hand to the little man. It was droll, this is an aside from Davy, it was droll how Alan dwelt on Mr. Rear's stature, for to say the truth, the one was no smaller than the other. <laughs> so, says he, continuing, I set my best foot forward, and whenever I met in with anyone, I cried out there was a wreck ashore. Man, they didn't they stop to fash with me. You should, should have seen them linking for the beach, and when they got there, they found they had had the pleasure of a run, which is aye good for a Campbell. <laughs> I'm thinking it was a judgment on the clan that the brig went down in the lump and didn't break. But it was a very unlucky thing for you, that same. For if, for if any wreck had come ashore, they would have hunted high and low and would soon have found you. Now, to me, Alan really comes alive when he speaks like that because this, he's got this wonderful... You can hear the Gallic intonations, but he's got this uh, mixture of Scots and English in there. And it seems to me that... Uh, there's no pastiche here for, on Stevens's part. There's no mockery of Highland accent or syntax, but there's respect. And there's a huge delight also in the Scots and a, a real sure touch in his light use of it. Um, so while I think I, re I would recommend an addition with a good glossary, I don't think the Scots should really give anyone too much trouble. Um, and, and of course, Stevenson, because he's writing in the persona of David Balfour, he doesn't try to reproduce any of the Gaelic. He simply says, I could hear them speaking Gaelic, but I couldn't understand what they were saying, but I recognised it was Gaelic. And again, it seems to me that's a very realistic way that David Balfour would record uh, what is going on. Um, I realise I'm running out of time, so I'm going to have to hurry up uh, quickly. But I think that, that by reading a book like Kidnapped, it may, with luck, open your students up to the possibilities of the Scots language and lead them to explore it further in other prose and poetry, as Diane was, I was talking about earlier on. Um, the Latin, uh, I'll just touch on very briefly when it comes in, it comes in at the end of the novel <coughs> via Mr. Rankila, the lawyer, and it is significant because it stamps the importance of law on the resolution of the plot. Um, so I've dealt with realism and I've dealt with Scottishness, rites of passage, Kidnapped is a rite of passage novel. Davy moves from childhood into adulthood. He's 16 when the story starts and 16 when it ends, but he has become a man in the interim. Um, 
And there are examples of this maturation all the way through the book. Um, uh, one example, when he comes first into Collington and is moving, going around the west side of Edinburgh to, to, to go to Cramond, he sees a regiment marching to the fifes, every foot in time. Um, and he sees this with great pleasure and wonder. He's excited by the redcoat soldiers. But when he sees redcoats in the Highlands later, it's with fear because he has crossed not just the Highland line and has had to rethink his loyalties, but he's also lost a great deal of his own innocence. And now he knows that the redcoats represent a danger to him. It happens over and over again. Um, he thinks he's turned the tables on Uncle Ebenezer and thinks he's grown up there. And then he finds he hasn't quite grown up enough. Um, because his uncle nearly succeeds in killing him. Um, he decides not to, when he decides not to betray Alan and joins him in the roundhouse on the Brig uh, Covenant uh, and, and later has to kind of almost parent Alan and then Alan has to parent him. These are all signs of growing up, of changing from being a child to an adult. Uh, and, and, and then when he works out how to get off the Isle of Erich, um, uh, that's a very important point in the book for him uh, to, in, t in terms of his growing up. Um, and the time that he spends on that islet is surely a very significant chapter uh, in this maturation process. It's a kind of hiatus between his first set of troubles and his reconnection with Alan and, and the journey that they then make back um, to their shared yet separate destinies. As Chris McLaughlin has noted, um, um, the, the, the Erich episode is almost the only time in the novel when Davy is truly and wholly alone and Stevenson gives that, uh, that section an entire chapter. Um, on the face of it, nothing much happens in that chapter, but actually lots happens because it, is, it, it seems to me it's the bridge between uh, David's uh, slightly innocent start in life uh, and, and where he goes to later on. And I'll need to move on a wee bit faster now or I'm going to run out of time. Um, uh, but one of the other things that, that, that I think you can see as a sim symbol of, of, of rites of passage is the number of times that Davy crosses water. Uh, he's always crossing water. When he finally gets off Erich onto Mull, he dashes across at low tide and realises he can get across uh, without getting water above his knees. But there are many, many more times when he's crossing lochs or rivers. Um, sometimes there's a moment when Alan says, you're going to have to jump over the, this torrent or you're going to hang, hang or drown. And Davy jumps across the water. Uh, and again, that's a, a lesson for him about how to move forward in life. Um, and then finally, of course, when they get to Lion Kilns, um, they, they get rowed across the Firth uh, back to Queen's Ferry by the last from the, 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 the inn. Um, and almost as often as he crosses water, um, Davy crosses thresholds into houses, into inns, into caves, into the roundhouse on the Covenant. Um, and finally, of course, he arrives at the door of the British Linen Company's bank. And it's when we leave him there at the end, he has his foot upon that threshold too. So he's always crossing water. He's always crossing in and out of, of houses and other places of refuge and so on. Very, very briefly, and I realise that I have uh, not timed this terribly well, um, um, there are other rites of passage that, uh, that, uh, that are really important in this book. Um, Davy learns the difference between family and friendship, and that actually friendship really, at the end of the day, trumps uh, family connections. And I've already touched on this. He also learns an awful lot about violence. Uh, it seems to me there's a huge amount of violence in this book. Some of it actually is quite positive in its impact because he learns how to defend himself. Um, and he learns that sometimes, actually, uh, you can achieve more by a quick act of violence than you can by sort of dithering uh, and not getting on with things. Um, uh, Alan, his, 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 who becomes obviously his great pal, uh, revels in violence. You know, that famous line, am I no a bonny fighter? Uh, he, he absolutely revels in violence. And of course, violence is, is endemic in the sense uh, throughout the Highlands. People resort to, to violence very, very quickly. Um, old weapons are pulled out from the thatch uh, when the folk of Appin anticipate reprisals for the murder of Colin Campbell. Violence is a defense mechanism, but it's also a means to power, to respect, or to money. The problem is that violence begets more violence, and it's that cycle that is broken at the end of the book 
uh, by Mr. Ryan Keeler and the application of, a, of the legal compromise that enables David to come into his inheritance. And it's interesting, if you think back to the start of the novel, the minister, David, uh, the minister Mr. Campbell, and again, Mr. Note, note the use of the, of the name Campbell there, so there's a, it's, it's not so, so black and white about Campbell's being always on the bad side. Um, at the outset of the novel, he said he advised Davy in all his dealings to be supple, uh, in the sense of being astute and clever, not, not necessarily too compliant. And actually, that's what happens at the end of the book. It's because of the suppleness of Mr. Rankila, the, the, the lawyer, that Ebenezer's blunderbuss is rendered ludicrous and Ebenezer is finally defeated. And perhaps it's that aspect, and I'm just about to finish, uh, Ronnie, I'm sorry, I'm running a couple of minutes late. Perhaps it's this aspect of kidnap the violence coupled with the idea of it being an adventure story about a 16-year-old boy that led to it being pigeonholed uh, early on as a book for boys. It's not a book for boys at all. It's a book for grown-ups, um, but it's also a book for, for girls too, for, for, for female readers, because there's so much going on in this novel uh, where readers of all kinds can empathise with Davy and with Alan, uh, with their experiences, the ups and downs of their relationship, the way that the friendship is described, the way that the quarrel is described and how they make up. It's a very, very mature novel, and yet, as I said at the start, it's intensely readable. And actually, you rush through it, not picking up on, on many of these very, very subtle points that Stevenson is making. And the honesty, it seems to me, the honesty of the first-person narrative comes straight through from Davy to the reader. And that brings me back to, my, uh, to the reading experience. As I said, I think in a way it's a shame that um, your students may be reading Kidnap for the first time, as a text to be studied. Because ideally, I think it's a book to be read for pleasure first and for reflection later. I really like Davy Balfour. I understand him. At 16, I feel I could have been him. And hopefully, some of your students will feel the same way. And so it worries me slightly that the pleasure of getting to know him may be diminished by the fact that essays and exams will follow. On the other hand, I'm really delighted that Scottish school students taking National 5 and Higher English do have to study at least one Scottish text. And of all the current selection, Kidnap strikes me as being the best, or certainly the best work of fiction. If you read Kidnapped, it seems to me you will know Scotland past and present that much better than you did before you started it. And of course, you will also have Katrina, the sequel, and the rest of Stevenson's wonderful output to look forward to afterwards. Thanks very much.